song I love to sing since I have been redeemed of my Redeemer, Savior, King, since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in his name, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. I have a Christ that satisfies since I have been redeemed. To do is will my highest price since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed. I will glory in his name. Since I have been redeemed. I will glory in my Savior's name. I have a witness bright and clear since I have been redeemed. Dispelling every doubt and fear since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed. I will glory in his name since I have been redeemed. I will glory in my Savior's name. I have a home prepared for me since I have been redeemed. Where I shall dwell eternally since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in his name. Since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. We move to a, another major division of the book of Acts tonight. Tonight we're in Acts chapter 10, looking at verses 1 through 4, a memorial before God. It's exciting as we move through the book of Acts to see the way in which God expands ministries and how God expands the ministry of the gospel to different groups of people. And that's what missions is all about. We've just had our missions conference this past week. I got to hear some tremendous messages from Unyong Bay, and also from Dr. Mark Kim, also from Reverend Keith Coleman, about the work that God is doing in Africa, and with Brother Coleman, uh, an extensive overview of the work that God has done through history, the way in which God takes his word and uses his special servants to carry the good news of Christ to those who have never heard. And we move into a new theme along that line tonight as we see the gospel being carried to the Gentiles. Up to this point, it's either been Jews or it's been half-breeds, those who are half-Jewish or half-Gentile or those who are Gentile by birth but Jewish by religion, those who are men, those who are women and children, those who are neither male nor female. And tonight, we look at God opening the door to the Gentiles. We've been looking at a series of contrasts, in fact, as we have been moving through these last two portions of the text in Acts chapter 9. We saw that there was a man who was sick of the palsy, and then there was a woman who was dead. We saw a difficult miracle versus an impossible miracle. With the man Aeneas, we saw that the Bible says that Peter found him. He didn't send somebody to go out searching for Peter. And as far as we know, this particular man never did anything good before he was healed. But then as we look at Tabitha, the woman who was dead, we saw that she did much good to the church before she was raised from the dead. But in both cases, it resulted in the salvation of many people who knew about those two. 
The miracles had a greater purpose than the one who was healed. And God has a greater purpose in your life, too, than merely answering your personal prayer requests for your own personal benefit. God has designed each of us to be a special, a very unique vessel, so that through us, the good news of Christ will spread as others see what Christ has done in our lives. We notice something else very interesting about this is in those two places, Peter only did, as far as we're told in the text, two miracles, though there were thousands and thousands of people. God then used that secondary instrument to be the one who spread the gospel. It wasn't because Peter had a great campaign in Lydda. It wasn't because he had a, a great campaign along the seacoast. God took an apostle, used him with one person, and then from that one person, an insignificant person, spread the gospel to hundreds, perhaps thousands of others. Never think of yourself as insignificant. Never think, I don't have an apostolic gift. I don't have a preaching gift. I don't have an evangelistic gift. God delights to use small things. God delights to use weak things. God delights to use insignificant things. Paul explains that in 1 Corinthians, where the weak things of the world, the despised things of the world... The people that are nobodies are the ones that God delights to use because then God is the one who receives the glory. You are important to God. Just like Aeneas, just like Tabitha, who was also called Dorcas. We also saw as a result of this that God, in his sovereignty, never will bypass someone whom he intends to touch. He doesn't have to use fancy means to accomplish his purposes. Peter did no magic. He merely spoke a word with authority to Aeneas. With the woman, he kneeled down first and prayed. We don't find him doing that with Aeneas. There is no magic formula that's being used here in the miracles that are being done. Peter merely said to Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise, make thy bed, and he arose immediately. We see no mention of any amount of faith that Aeneas had or that he requested healing. Dorcas obviously could not exercise any personal faith in order to be raised from the dead. Many of the modern charismatic faith healer types say, oh, you don't have quite enough faith to be healed. As we look at the majority of the New Testament miracles, there is no indication that any of them had to have this huge amount of faith before they were healed. We saw that the command for the healing required an active response. Get up and make your bed. He didn't just stagger up. He rolled up his mat. He started moving. We saw that there was parallels with this in the Gospels. In fact, in all four of the Gospels, as Jesus healed the paralytic there. We find that he had a visible testimony, and Dorcas had a visible testimony. All they that dwelt in Lydda and Saron saw him and turned unto the Lord. And turned unto the Lord. We find that in verse 42, it was known throughout all Joppa concerning Tabitha. And many believed in the Lord. They had a visible and vocal testimony. Do you have a visible and vocal testimony about what God has done in your life? As I look out over the audience tonight, I think that I see only believers out here. Now, perhaps you have fooled me, but I think every one of you are believers. That means that God has done something in your life. How many people know what God has done in your life? Did you know that salvation is a greater miracle than the healing of a paralytic? 
In fact, salvation is a greater miracle than raising the physically dead. Because God reaches down to those who are not merely spiritually dead, but they are in spiritual rebellion against him. And God reaches down and touches us also with his word and raises us to spiritual life. Do all those around you, as with Dorcas and with Aeneas, do all those around you know what God has done in your life? Are they well aware of it? Do you not let them rest until they know very clearly? And they too are changed. We saw that nobody called for Peter at Lydda to help Aeneas, but the disciples at Joppa called Peter to solve the tougher problem at Joppa. There was no missionary call to get Peter to Lydda, but there was a clear call for help at Joppa. It was like Paul's missionary call. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. We would never have guessed the route that Peter would go back to Jerusalem, but God was directing his way. God plans the special intersections in life. That's one of the things that is very, very clear in the book of Acts. God plans the intersections in your life, too. You don't know who you are going to run into this week. You don't know with whom you will have opportunity to speak. God is going to cause your path. Pay attention to it this week. God is going to cause your path this week to intersect with the path of someone else that perhaps you were not expecting. Will you be alert to it? Will you pay attention to the fact that God is actively and I mean actively directing your life. This morning we were talking about the Good Shepherd in Psalm 23. He leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He leads us as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You stay with the shepherd if you want to get safely across the valley. You stay with the shepherd if you want light in the darkness. Are you following his lead? If so, he has a purpose in leading you. A purpose for causing your path to intersect with the path of someone with whom you will have a unique ministry. What will you do with that intersection? Will you be like Philip? The Spirit said, join yourself to this chariot. The chariot was moving faster than Philip was moving. It says he had to run to catch up with the chariot. He didn't say, oh, it must not be that chariot. That chariot just went by. It must be where I stand on the road and wait for the next guy to come. Will you be sensitive to the direction of the Spirit of God as he causes your path to intersect with the life of someone else? Clearly here, Peter has just had two divinely planned intersections. There are no accidents in the plan of God. Only incidents. And then we looked at Tabitha herself. We saw that she used her talents for Christ. She used her talents to serve others in the body of Christ. And we asked ourselves the question, what about us? Are you using the talents that God has given you to serve the body of Christ? We looked at the different gifts that she had. Very clearly, she had the gift of helps, the gift of mercy, the gift of ministration, the gift of giving. Those are every believer gifts. Are you using those gifts? Are you using mercy? Which enables you to cheerfully provide practical relief and not mere pity for suffering believers. Are you using the gift of helps? The gift of helps enables every believer to strengthen weakened believers by bearing part of their workload. Are you using the gift of giving? The gift of giving enables every believer to provide money and genuine need-based material goods to needy believers, cheerfully, generously, freely, and in simplicity. To support the corporate ministry of the church, the outreach of the church, the pastor or evangelist of the church, to support sister churches undergoing persecution and or severe need. The gift of giving is a very broad gift and used in many different ways, as we've seen in the New Testament. And finally, the gift of ministration, which enables every believer to humbly serve other believers. 
It's a humble service gift, no glory in it. The best example is our Lord Jesus Christ. He is our example because he is the one who is the greatest example of all of the gifts. It shall not be so among you, but whosoever shall be great among you shall be your minister. Same root as the gift of ministration. Whosoever you will be chiefest shall be servant of all. For the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And that brings us to our text tonight. We move from Aeneas and from Tabitha to a totally different setting. Acts chapter 10, starting in verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house and gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Here's another intersection, a divine intersection where God directly reaches down to an individual and changes the course of his life and tells him to do something so that he will have an intersection with a human being. An intersection between a man and an angel, not for the purpose of merely having an angel talk to him. God could have used any other means that he chose to do so. He could have sent Cornelius on an errand for going to Joppa and have Peter run into him on the street. God did not do that. God could have first told Peter, go to Caesarea. I've got an intersection in life for you there. God did not do that. What we see in all of these intersections of life as we move through the book of Acts is God is not stuck in a mechanical formula. God doesn't always have to do everything exactly like it was done before. There's sort of a, uh, a funny saying that you hear in seminary, and the professors remind you of that, is that when you get to a church, you may discover that there is a very great resistance to change. And they have reminded us that the seven last words of the church are, we never did it that way before. <laughs> We're all very, very slow to make any kind of change, and in some cases that is good. But God is certainly not limited in the way in which he acts. He does the most amazing and different things. It takes us by surprise. Here we find he sends an angel to a Gentile military officer. <laughs> Not been done before in the book of Acts. And yet God chooses to do it at this point because he is about to make a direct reverse change in Jewish thinking. He's about to do something that was so far beyond the way the Jews would think that it is almost unimaginable to them. And so we find the divine appearance of an angelic being speaking to a Gentile. Now, as the Jews read their Old Testament, they would have known that there were divine manifestations to Gentiles in the Old Testament. The Midianites, for example, who had a dream and saw that Gideon and his host were going to come and roll over their camp. Nebuchadnezzar, for example, in the book of Daniel, who has the first the vision of the great image with the head of gold and the chest and arms of silver and the loins of brass and the, the, the legs and the feet of iron and the toes of iron and clay mixed. God did, on various occasions, reveal himself to Gentiles, but never in a manner like this, whereby Gentiles would suddenly become part of and co-equal with those who were Jews. God had given an outline of Gentile history, and he used Gentiles, and he even used the Gentile language to do it, 
As we find in the book of Daniel, the majority of that book is written in Aramaic. But to make the Gentiles equal with the Jews, it is a major hinge in the book of Acts, what we're running into here. We find that this man is very important in the plan of God. As we look at him, we discover that there are no less than ten different descriptive notices given to us about who this man is. This is very significant. God doesn't just say, well, there was a guy called Cornelius and here's what happened to him. It tells us a lot of things about this particular Cornelius. Just like God started with Jewish males in Acts 2 when the church was first formed, God starts with a Gentile male when he opens the door to the newly forming body of Christ. There was a certain man. We notice also that God chooses individuals through whom others will come to Christ. We've already seen that with Aeneas. We've already seen that with Dorcas. Now we're going to see it with Cornelius. God is not only going to save Cornelius, but there's going to be a whole group of people that get saved as a result of Cornelius. Every individual is important in the plan of God. You and I were each saved for specific reasons in the plan of God. Have you ever paused to think about that? We who believe in the sovereignty of God, and certainly I do, and I believe you do too, believe that God has a detailed plan. Not merely a general plan, but a detailed plan that includes all the nuts and bolts, if you will, of history. We think it not strange when we think of a great architect such as Christopher Wren to be able to have all the details down for the magnificent structures which he designed. We think it not strange that those who are involved in the designing of a spacecraft or a giant ocean liner have it all down as to where the bolts must be placed in the plates and the welding take place for that ship to be able to float and withstand the different pressures that will be placed on it as it goes through the heavy seas. Why should we be surprised when God has a divine plan that includes details? even details that seem to us at times to be unpleasant. In a great ship, there is a boiler room where there is pressure, where there is fire, where there are men who are sweating, where there are men who are working very hard as we dine in the elegant dining room up on the top deck. The plan of God includes much that we never see, and yet much that keeps the ship which he has designed moving forward through the waves to get from one destination to the other destination as he carries us to fulfill his plan. That's what we see about to happen here with Cornelius. It says that this man was in Caesarea. There was a certain man in Caesarea. A very great contest, a contrast to the first group of men who were saved. That first group was in Jerusalem, Jewish men, Jewish city. Now we find a Gentile man in a Gentile city. Caesarea is a completely Gentile city. It was on the coast. It was not named for a Jewish hero. It was not named after the Maccabees. It was not named after Samson. It was not named... It was named after Caesar, the head of the Roman Empire. That's where Cornelius was. Not at Jerusalem, the city of God. He was in Caesarea. And this is the full name, the Caesarea Palestina, to designate it as separate from Caesarea Philippi which is only about 50 miles from Damascus at the foot of Mount Hermon. This is a seacoast town that we're talking about. 
It's the sea upon which the gospel is going to be spread. We know that later Paul is brought here to Caesarea before he sets sail for Rome. Caesarea. There's going to be a key individual in Caesarea. A town where the gospel will spread across the seas. Caesarea Palestina. It's significant that the first Gentile was saved in a fully Gentile city that was built and controlled by Gentiles. It says he was called Cornelius. You know, we think of that as a first name. And many people have received as a first name the name Cornelius. But it's an indication of a family name. The Cornelii were noble and distinguished family of Rome, an ancient family of Rome, held many, many positions in Rome. This man was not a of a mongrel race like the Samaritans who were half Gentile and half Jewish. He was what you would call a pure blood of the conquering race, the Romans. That would be further supported by his military, sub, sub, excuse me, his military position and by the group of soldiers that he was assigned to lead, a very special group as we'll see in a moment. God did not choose to have the first Gentile convert be a nobody. He chose a man with noble blood so that there would be no human excuse for the Jews to look down their noses at the Gentiles. And they were usually very ready to look down their noses at the Gentiles. They called them dogs. Not a very complimentary term. This was a man who was a pure blood. Peter had been given, as you remember back in the Gospels, the keys to the kingdom by our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the last time that he uses those keys in introducing a new group into the body of Christ. He was key in each of the different instances where a new group was brought in at Jerusalem, the Jews, at Samaria. Peter and John were called to Samaria before the Samaritans were officially recognized. Peter is the one who is called here to bring in the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. He was a centurion, it tells us, called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. A centurion was a man who was assigned to head 100 men. That was a key position in Roman military terms. In every Roman legion, there were 60 centurions. A, 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 a legion was composed of about 6,000 men. But among the centurions, there were various degrees of rank. There were those in the first rank, the second rank, and the third rank. In other words, one of those centurions would be in charge of the entire legion. Another would be in charge of one half of the legion under this head centurion, and another would be in charge of the second half of the legion. It's, it's fascinating when you begin, and we won't go over all the military terms tonight and all the different ranks that f fell within those Roman legions, but Cornelius was stationed with a very particular group, sort of as his personal strike force, at a key Roman town that controlled an access to the ocean and controlled access on a road going up and down north and south, which was a major trade route. He was probably, though we cannot say it for sure, probably one of the first, second, or third rank of the centurions. He certainly had a very exclusive and elite group of soldiers who were directly under him. As we look at the various passages of the New Testament, we discover that the centurions were usually men of intelligence and who had great leadership skills. In fact, there are quite a number of centurions that are mentioned in the New Testament, and they are key players at various critical junctures in the New Testament. We find a centurion who was a witness of the miracles of Christ and a recipient of the blessings of a miracle. And he is set in contrast with his faith to the Jews who did not believe. Listen to Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse 5. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, and saying, Lord, thy servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion, now this is a man who understands the military. He understands ranking officers. 
He understands the difference between a sergeant and a general. He understands his position in the military. Though it is a ranking position, he understands that it does not have equal rank with Christ. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. He's a man who has others who are underneath him, and he's a man who obviously cares about others, not merely other soldiers. A good military leader will always care about the men in his ranks. He's a man who cares about his slave. And he comes to the only one that he knows of, who can help his slave. Speak the word only and my servant shall be healed, for I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled, and said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Here's a Gentile military leader who is of the nation that has conquered the Jews, humbling himself before a Jewish rabbi because he believes so that Jewish rabbi can do something for a man who is under his authority, something that he himself cannot do. Jesus goes on, and I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. He's alluding to that centurion. But the children of the kingdom, that's the Jews who had no faith. I have found no, not such great a faith, no, not in Israel. The children of the kingdom shall be cast out into utter darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the self same hour. Before Peter ever goes to the centurion at Caesarea, Jesus had already had contact with the centurion. Peter was there on this occasion. We find Peter would have been among the disciples surrounding Jesus and wondering what's going on with this Gentile. I mean, the centurions didn't walk around in street clothes like plain clothesmen. They were always in full military garb, certainly out in public. And suddenly a Roman centurion, a man with authority, comes up. And there was probably murmuring in the crowd as to what's going on. Is he going to arrest him? What's going to happen here? And instead the centurion comes and begs Jesus to heal a slave. It would have made an impression on Peter. And yet we find later in our text in Acts chapter 10, Peter resisting... The idea, until God changes his mind, of going up to the home of a centurion miles away, a very difficult journey. We find also the same passage given to us in Luke chapter 7. When he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. And a certain centurion's servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy of whom he should do this, for he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. Now, people look at this and they say, you know what we have here is a conflict in the texts. 
Ah, we find a mistake in the Bible. <laughs> no, what we have is at least two centurions. What we have here are different instances because as you look at the details and compare them in the first instance, it's the centurion himself who comes. Now we find a centurion who asks the Jewish leaders whom he has helped. He's built them a synagogue. Folks, it does not cost a little tiny bit of money to build a synagogue or a church building like this. Think of what it would cost to build a building like this today. How many millions of dollars would it cost to build a building like this? Here's a man who out of his own pocket built a synagogue for the Jews. Here's a man who obviously had good relationship with the Jewish leaders. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but send the word, and my servant shall be healed. And this is the report that is being brought. For I am also a man under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say to one, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doeth it. And again we find Jesus saying the words, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. We find another key centurion in the life and in the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. We find a centurion who is a witness to the cross. Matthew 27, 54, Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. Mark records the instance also when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he cried out so and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. We find some additional words given in Luke, chapter 23, verse 47. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. Do you wonder why there are two different statements given? In Matthew and Mark, it speaks of him as the Son of God, but here it says, Certainly this was a righteous man. In each of the Gospels, we find the selective things that point to the purpose of that Gospel. And here we find emphasized both the deity of Christ in Matthew and Mark and the humanity of Christ emphasized in Luke. He was the one who was both God and man. We find the centurions, the word of one centurion alone was enough for a legal testimony we find that in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15. A legal testimony that was believed allowing the burial of Jesus, significant to dispel all doubts about the resurrection. The soldiers guarding the tomb had a whole bunch of different stories to tell about the disciples coming and stealing Jesus' body away, but the legal account was given by a centurion. Verse 44. And Pilate marveled if he were already dead, and calling unto him the centurion, he asked him whether it had been any while dead. And when he knew it of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. The legal testimony of the centurion. We find as we move into the book of Acts, there are other centurions in the book of Acts as well. There was one who was stationed in charge of the Antonia Fortress at Jerusalem. That was a key military Roman outpost. We find the centurion had a captain over him. He was one of the lesser ranked centurions. And we find as Paul has stood on the stairs and has spoken to the Jews in the Hebrew language and there's been a great silence and then finally when he gives testimony to the fact that God has sent him unto the Gentiles, they can't tolerate that thought. They begin to tear their clothes and throw dirt in the air and say, away with him, it's not fit for him to live. And they bring Paul into the castle, the Antonia Fortress, which overlooked the temple courtyard. And they're going to beat the Apostle Paul. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? 
When the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. A man who knew Roman law. A man who understood the rights of a Roman citizen. He's going to go to a, a captain who has purchased his Roman citizenship, but Paul has one up on the chief captain over the Antonio Fortress because Paul was born a Roman citizen. And so immediately they leave off beating the Apostle Paul. A key centurion that God used placed at a key location at a key time in the life of Paul. We find in Acts chapter 24, again a centurion. He commanded a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty and that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or come unto him. Paul was important enough to have a centurion assigned to him as his personal bodyguard. We get to Acts chapter 27, and we find that Paul is about to go to Rome, and it was determined that we should sail into Italy. They delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. This is a different group of soldiers. The first was the Italian band. This is Augustus' band. That's a personal group of soldiers attached to the emperor. And there the centurion, getting down to verse 6, there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing to Italy, and he put us therein. We get further into the passage, down to verse 11. And we find that they've already made it out to the island, and they're about to sail. They don't want to winter at that spot, because it's not a very good place to winter. And so the master of the ship says, I think the wind is okay. I think we'll be able to sail. I think we'll be safe. Paul says, don't do it. We're going to have problems if we do. You're going to lose the ship. It says the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than the things which were spoken by Paul. He's going to regret that later on as the storm gets up its full strength, Eurachlidon. He's going to regret that as they throw everything overboard. He's going to regret that as everybody is so seasick they can't eat for days and days and days. And so finally, when Paul stands up and says, an angel of God stood by me in the night and told me, Paul, you're going to lose a ship, but you're not going to lose one of the 276 people on board of it. And so when Paul tells the centurion, these sailors are going to try to let down boats as though they were going to cast anchors out, but what they're really going to do is try to get away. Don't let them do it. The centurion cuts the ropes. And then when the soldiers decide they're going to try to kill the Apostle Paul along with all the other prisoners, the centurion stops them because he wants to save Paul. God puts key people in our lives, sometimes those in positions of authority, because of benefit that he wants us to have. Listen to those verses. Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Verse 43, But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. Verse 16 of chapter 28, And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with the soldier that kept him. Key centurions... Quite a few of them, as a matter of fact, as we move through the Gospels and as we move through the book of Acts. We're going to learn more about Cornelius as we get a little farther into this passage, down in verse 22. And they said, these are the messengers who have come from Cornelius after he's had his vision. And they've come down looking for Peter. And they said, Cornelius the centurion, and we learn more about him, a just man, one that feareth God, and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words of thee. We have much more to learn about Cornelius, but we'll take what we can tonight. He was a man of the band called the Italian Band. We already mentioned this before, but that was a choice group of soldiers. Rome, at this time, encompassed everybody from the British Isles all the way to the border of Persia, out in the east, all the way up to the northern edges, up near Scandinavia, 
and also all across the northern shores of Africa. This was a very elite group. It was all Italians. There were Roman legions that were made up of people who were not Italians at all. There were those in Galatia, what we call modern-day France and the country surrounding it. They became Romans and they became Roman soldiers. But this was the Italian band. They were proud of the fact that they were all Romans by birth. These were elite, top-notch, crack troops. A devout man, one that feareth God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He was devout, very interesting word. That gives us indication that he had had an impact made on him by the God of Israel, by the Jews who were in that area. Perhaps he was even a proselyte, though we are not told that. It says he was one that feared God. Now you've heard me preach on that subject. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the holy is understanding. One that feared God. It doesn't say one that feared the gods. The Romans had many gods. It says one that feared God in the singular. But being a God-fearer is not enough. He's not a saved man yet at this point. He's not saved until we get over to later in the passage where he and his house hear the word concerning Christ. You see, outside of Jesus, there is no salvation. He's a God-fearer. And it says, one that feared God with all his house. That tells us something else about this man. He was a leader in his own family. He was a man who not only knew how to lead military men, he was a man who knew how to lead his own house. When I lived in San Antonio, I was serving as an associate pastor of the church there. We had many, many, many military men from the various bases in the San Antonio area that would come to church. They were Christian men. They were Christian men in the military. Many of them were officers in the military. It was many years ago, 30 almost 40 years ago. Last time I was in pastoral ministry in San Antonio, 37 years ago. But I noticed something. Some of those men were very skilled in military leadership. And some of them had the most horrendous family problems. They could not lead their own wives. They could not lead their own children. When they were on the base... All of the lower ranking officers and infantrymen would do what they said, but they had no control of their own homes. Here's a man, it says, one who feared God with all his house. He was a spiritual leader in his own family. It tells us something else about him. It says, which gave much alms. He was a compassionate man. Now, that tells you something else. He was not a covetous man either. That's why it can tell us he feared God. You see, a man who is a covetous man worships a different God. Colossians 3.5 and Ephesians 5.5 5 both say the covetous man is an idolater. Do you have greed in your heart to build your bank account, to build your stock portfolio, to build your material wealth, to gather the things of this world, to hoard them for yourself and for what purpose, for you will die and leave it all behind? A covetous man is an idolater. Cornelius proved that he didn't have covetousness because it doesn't just say he gave alms, or he gave a tithe, it says he gave much alms. The money that he had, he used for the good of others. Money was not his God. It says he gave much alms to the people. That's, he gave much alms to the nation that his country had conquered. Then it tells us he prayed to God always. Interesting, he's a man with a prayer life, though he's not yet saved. But he had a God consciousness. 
The Apostle Paul explains in the opening three chapters of the book of Romans that all men are responsible for knowing God through three different things. Number one, they're responsible for knowing God because of creation. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. All men everywhere have access to creation around them. They can see it. Romans chapter 2 talks about the man's conscience. How our conscience either excuses or doesn't excuse us when we do right or we do wrong. We know that there is a right and we know that there is a wrong. We are not merely animals who are doing our own thing based on the survival of the fittest. We have a conscience. We know there's a God. We know what kind of a God he is because we know he has things that are right and we know that he has things that are wrong. And either we do what's right or we do what's wrong and we know it when we do it. Romans chapter 3 tells us that he's a God who has revealed himself in scripture. And that's why as we get to the end of Romans chapter 3 that it tells us that all men regardless of who they are or where they are located, are without excuse, responsible for knowing God, and that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now here's a man who is clearly among God's elect, Cornelius. He's a man who has responded to the first two areas of divine revelation. He knows there's a God. It says one that feareth God. He's a man who has a conscience. He's a man who knows right from wrong. And he sees people around him in need. And he does something about it. He's a man who perhaps has had an inkling of who the true God is because he's lived among the Jews. And now he's a man who, because he has responded to the light which he was given. Listen carefully. He's a man who, because he has responded to the light which was given, is now given further light. As that angel comes into him, he says, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. He had responded to the light which he had been given. He prayed to God always. And now we find the next phrase, he saw a vision. God is the one who sent the vision of the angel. God has reached down to him. God had been drawing him, though he did not know it at the time. God had been irresistibly drawing him to himself so that he would be ready for the vision of the angel. God uses different Ways to draw people to himself. We see that all through the book of Acts. It says it was about the ninth hour. In Roman time, that's nine o'clock in the morning. In other words, it wasn't in the misty dark. He wasn't on drugs. He wasn't drunk. Just like we find the Jews gathered at Jerusalem early in the morning. Hey, Peter says to them, we're not drunk. We're giving you the word of God. Here's God doing it with a Gentile on Gentile time, not in the middle of the night. He saw an angel of God coming into him. Angels, angels are messengers. That's what the word angelos means. It's a messenger. Angels are used by God as messengers all the way through Scripture. And whenever God sends them, they have a specific message. They have a specific purpose. You never find an angel bringing a message and saying, well, I really don't know why I'm here, but, you know, here I am. Look, I'm an angel. Look at me wave my wings. Never find anything like that. There is always a specific message designed for a specific purpose and because it is accordance to the purpose of God for that individual. And then it says, The angel said unto him, Cornelius. That tells me something important. God knows us by name. God knows who we are. He knows where we are and he knows where we live. You cannot escape 
the living God. Remember that. Jonah tried. God had called him by name too, but Jonah ran away. In fact, Jonah ran away from Joppa, which is where Peter is located at this time. Cornelius is called on another, uh, another seaport at Caesarea, Caesarea Palestina, and he doesn't run away. He wants to hear more of what God will say. Jonah didn't want to go and preach to Gentiles, the Assyrians. God was going to take Peter from that seaport where Jonah left to run away, and God is going to take Peter and send him to another Gentile. Do you see the beautiful pictures that God gives us in Scripture? The takeoff point for one person going the wrong way is the takeoff point for one person going the right way. You can't argue location. You can't argue time in history. You can't argue all the things that we use as excuses for not obeying God. Cornelius, God knows us by name. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. He was afraid. You know, it's interesting as we move through Scripture, when men come in contact with the divine, with the supernatural, they are afraid. Men who are out of fellowship are afraid. Adam and Eve hid themselves in the garden. And God says to Adam, Ayecha, where art thou, Adam? And God says, how come you're hiding back there? He says, well, I was afraid. I heard you in the garden, and I was naked, and I covered myself. Men who are in fellowship are afraid. We find Peter and James and John on the Mount of Transfiguration, and suddenly Jesus is transformed before them, and there's Moses and Elijah and a voice coming out of heaven, and they're terrified. They're gathered together in the upper room after the resurrection, and when Jesus comes, they're afraid. Here's a man who has been praying, and as he's praying, the angel appears to him and he's afraid. Fear is a human condition. We've talked about that in detail. He looked on him and he was afraid. But what does the angel say to him? Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. He obeyed the light that he had and God gave him more light. He obeyed in the practical sense, not merely in the head knowledge sense. The prayers and the alms are what have come before God as a memorial. It's a memorial that God has not forgotten. Here we find him very much like Dorcas. You remember what she did? She gave alms too. She made clothing for the poor too. She was a Jewish woman with an interesting combination of Gentile names. She was a believer to begin with. Here's a man who is not yet saved. But we find them doing very similar types of things. Thy prayer and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. I wonder if any of us have as much of a prayer life as that centurion did. A man who was a very busy man. I don't think any of us here are as busy as the centurion would have been. A man with military rank, a man who was continually obligated to fulfill duties related to hundreds of other people under him, a man who had duties of responsibility to those who were over him, a man who was located in a key position where there was a great amount of of trade going on and possible infiltration and the possibility of others coming into that port who should not be there. He was a busy man. But it says that he prayed to God always. He was a man who not merely had a formal prayer life, he was a man who had a continual prayer life going on throughout the day. 
Do you? Do you? You wonder how many years he had done this. When did he start that? When he first came to Israel? When he was first assigned there? When he was put in charge of this group of troops? When did he begin this regular prayer life? How long did it go on before God finally said, All right, Cornelius, you followed the light that I gave you. Now I have something very exciting to tell you. How long do we pray for things before God gives us answers? How long have you prayed for a specific request and perhaps have not yet seen it answered? I can tell you that I have one uncle for whose salvation I prayed for 50 years. And God answered that prayer. It was a prayer request that I brought before the throne of God on a daily basis. An uncle whom I loved very much. I prayed for him for 50 years. And after 50 years, God answered that prayer. Never give up. Thy prayers and thine alms are come up before God. They've come up as a memorial. That is, God has remembered them. All the way back to the first time you started that prayer life. God has watched it. And he's watched it day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, perhaps decade after decade. He has watched it. And now here it is. It has come, as it were, in a basket. And it has come up before God as a memorial. And God is about to answer that. And by answering it, not only you, but your house will be saved as well. And your friends and everybody that you bring into that house. Do you pray that God will use you that way? Do you pray that God will reach your family that way? Do you pray that God will reach your friends that way? Do you have your house open so that God can use it as he does here with Cornelius' house? There's much more to say on that, but we'll wait until we get to that point. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the testimony of this man Cornelius, a man who took what little spiritual light he had and used it to the best of his ability. Father, we are very small in our spiritual lives. We are very small in our prayer lives. But you are looking for people who are faithful, you're looking for people who are consistent. You're looking for people who don't make excuses about how busy they are. You're looking for people who don't set aside their prayer time and their prayer life because they have other things to do. You're looking for people who put you first. You're looking for people who are open to being used regardless of how embarrassing it is, regardless of whether or not they are in a proud position or not. You're looking for people who don't care how awkward it may be, but they're open and available. Father, make us people who are open and available, whose prayers and alms come up before you whose prayers and alms come up as a memorial to which you respond and give us your blessing. Thank you, Father, again for this, your word. We pray that you will take it and use it in our hearts to the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, the one who is our Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.